Why don't we, real quick, why don't we just get back in the spirit of worship? Why don't we just, as we're seating, begin to lift our hands right now? Just lift your hands and raise your voice right now and just reach out to Jesus one more time before the word is brought. Lord Jesus, we are here to receive from you, O oh God. The whole point of everything, God, is for us to make contact with you, Jesus. Remove every distraction, oh God. Remove every weight, Jesus. Hallelujah. Why don't you just give him a hand clap of praise right now? Hallelujah, Jesus. Those of you that remain, if you will stand with me as we read our text this morning. We are going to be reading... Genesis chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. The Lord has been very heavy on me with this message. Um, I keep notes with thoughts that the Lord gives me, and some of the pieces that I will be sharing with you this morning, the Lord gave me over a year ago. And he has been very very heavy on me, so I am, please pray for me as, uh, as I bring this to you this morning. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 through 8 says, and this is Adam and Eve, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Sin always looks good in the beginning. It always seems to have a pleasant look in the beginning. But there's always a hidden agenda to sin. Verse 7, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And for the first time ever in the history of humanity, a space was created between man and God. For the first time in existence, a space was created between creation and the Creator. Verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They went from walking daily with God to hiding from his voice. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And if you will give me a moment of your time to share this thought with you this morning, give me space. Give me space. If you will pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence, oh God. And I thank you for everything that you have already done, Lord. We give you the glory and the honor for all of it, Jesus. We are so thankful for the chains that have already been broken and the victory that has already been received, God. And we ask that your word would be accepted this morning, God, that every ear would be open and every eye would receive, God, that our hearts would be ready to receive from you this morning, Lord. Remove me, your messenger, completely out of the way and let only only your spirit and your voice be heard this morning, God. Let no flesh get in the way. Let no distraction get in the way. And let not the voice of the enemy stand this morning, God. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Give the Lord another hand clap of praise. You may be seated. We were created to be God's companions, to be those that, that love God and serve him with a desire to do as he pleases and to, to move on love. And, and for some reason, we couldn't even get our created purpose correctly. It was not long that we walked the earth and we began to put a space between us and the God who loved us so very much. 
It was this space that caused the, the plan that God put into place for he would one day be found on Calvary to, be, to die for our sins as a lamb slain at the slaughter, to be, have his blood pour out on us. It was this plan that was made to create and destroy this space that we had created. There is an epidemic attitude plaguing our world today. An attitude that says you must give me space and allow me a room. The world is screaming and demanding for a safe, protected place for all its evils and its sin. It wants a space in your mind. It wants a room in your home. It wants contact with your children and silence from our churches. It no longer wants us to even just turn a blind eye, but it demands we look it face to face and accept it for what it is. Whenever there is a stance or a voice that speaks against this attitude, it cries the louder, give me space. It's an attitude that will not hear correction. It will not keep boundaries. It cannot stand to not be accepted. And it most definitely will not keep to itself. Once it gains ground, it demands more. Once it gains a mind, it wants the next mind. Once it gains a lifestyle, it wants all of it. It wants our resolve, it wants our integrity, and it wants our truth that we hold so dear. Church, as the ambassadors of heaven, we must not allow this attitude to enter the body of Christ. There must be love. There must be a church that has a heart big enough to accept anything that walks through the doors. But we must have someone that is willing to stand and say, homosexuality is a sin and there you can be restored from it. Amen. Someone's got to say that pornography and drug addiction is not normal and it can be broken. That suicide is not an answer at all. That fear and depression and anxiety can be brought to peace. There must be those willing to cry, John 8, 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. We must be a church that cries the name of Jesus over every situation. The greatest thing that you can be for your family is a church of the living God. The greatest thing that you can be at school and on your job is a Holy Ghost filled, born again, apostolic who is unashamed. The world wants you to give them space and accept their sin. Be friends with them, but you will, you must not speak against it. You must not say that I am in the wrong. You must not say that there is more to my life than this. We have got to stop worrying about what the bound think of the free. We have got to stop worrying about those, who what they are saying about us when they are bound by chains. And we can raise our holy hands in the worship of our Lord Jesus. We cannot let the chains of the lost shackle the mouth of the saved. We cannot refuse to speak because they want us to accept them. Acceptance of the sin is condemning them to an eternity of hell. We cannot be afraid. We must speak. We must multiply liberty. Romans 5, 19 through 21, for as by one man's disobedience, we just read it, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And in case you didn't know, that's talking about Jesus. 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. God created the law. Not to condemn us, but to expose sin so that we would know what we are being freed from. 
but where sin abound. Grace did much more abound. We've got a world that does things because they think they have no choice. We got a world that gets darker every day because they know no other life. We got a world that cannot sleep at night because they have not met the comforter. They have not met the Prince of Peace. Verse 21, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The most despicable, evil person you can think of that you have ever met in your entire life has the opportunity to receive more grace than you could ever imagine. There is no limit to Jesus. Stop putting a limit on him when we look at people. We, we subconsciously put a limit on God's power when we look at the chains people carry. We look at people who are lost and covered in sin, who are selling their bodies on the street, and we say, you know what, it's going to take a whole lot. But Jesus said, where that abounds, I much more abound. But for people who are in the people business, we get so caught up on stuff. We get caught up on the clothes that people wear. We get caught up on the hygiene. We get caught up on their personality. Their personality just clashes with mine. And the list can go on and on and on. We have got to take that list that holds us back, take it to the altar, and burn it under the name of Jesus. We cannot hold a Pharisee's attitude. In the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, we're going to read about some Pharisees. Then came together unto him, that is Jesus, the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples, excuse me, I lose my voice really fast. I'm going to be praying that God gets me some strength on that. No, I've, I've already gone through puberty, I promise. <clears throat> and when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. If we are looking for issues with our brothers and sisters and those who need to be saved, we will find them. You are going to find it. If you look for a fault in me, it is not a needle in a haystack. You are going to find it quick. But we must have a spirit to not look. We must have a spirit that puts away gossip. We must have a spirit that does not give room to fault. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. I also find it funny that when Jesus is trying to deal with and place conviction on us, our sixth sense of finding fault with others is heightened. Whenever Jesus begins to deal with us, we always look for something with somebody else. Whenever Jesus puts conviction on our life like Adam and Eve, we begin to run from the Holy Ghost. We have got to allow him to place conviction on our life. Verse 3 says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands, often they eat not holding the tradition of the elders. And I can see them just wrapping their cloak as they say this. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. We don't just wash our hands. We wash everything. We are clean. We are perfect. 
Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And Jesus said unto them, Well, hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites? As it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And for the next 10 verses, Jesus absolutely begins to lay them out. Because the religious examples of the day were more worried about the cleanliness of their hands, pots, and pans, more than the cleanliness of their actions and words which Jesus informed them exposes the condition of their hearts. Is Jesus saying, Brother Wyatt, that I don't need to wash my hands? Absolutely not. <laughs> Please wash your hands. But he was letting them know that a dirty grape won't hurt anything, but filthy speech from an unright heart will. than a mindset of looking out from our high horse because we come in every Sunday, every Wednesday, and every Friday. We lift our holy hands and we worship God and we look down on sinners and we look down on those who need an ambassador from heaven. No, no, no. We have got to be more loving than we are. A quick Google search found me that only 65% of women wash their hands after using the restroom. Y'all are nasty. The Pharisees would have had a time with you, ladies. I didn't look up the men. I'm joking, I'm joking, I've looked it up. Coming in at an overwhelming first place, 31% of men wash their hands after going to the restroom. That is nearly half of the population do not wash their hands. I don't know which side it is this morning. <laughs> I'm going to be greeting you all with elbows today. Throughout our day, nearly 70% of men and 35% of the women that you come in contact with shake hands, receive food from, use the door, gas pump, and everything else after have filthy, disgusting, nasty hands. As horrifyingly gross as that is, lowering that number does not even come close to the importance of raising the number of those who have come in contact with the saving blood of the Lamb. We get so caught up on stuff. We look at half the population and say, you're dirty and nasty. You need to wash your hands. Go back and wash your hands, boy. But we won't speak a word of Jesus into their life. We so easily forget the Bible says such were some of you. On a good day, I forget that I struggle with self-value sometimes. I'm just being transparent. I had a day this week. I was sitting there at work, and I don't know what was going on. I texted my wife. I said, I need you to pray for me because I'm having an attack over, mine, over my mind. And I was sitting there, and my mind was telling me, you're worthless. And I began to have hate for myself. We love to walk in the house and pretend that everything's okay. Because we have those good days. We sang the song this morning, Blessed Be Your Name, when the sun is shining down on me and the world is all as it should be. Let me tell you something. The world has never been all as it should be. I love the song, and I don't mean to contradict what it's saying, 
But the world needs us. On a good day, we are able to sing that song and say, the world is all as it should be, everything is fine, and we'll forget to witness. Titus 3, 3 through 5 says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy. We were hateful. We were hating one another. Verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, towards man appeared. As I was sitting at work hating myself, and I texted my wife to pray for me, Jesus appeared. And he said, and, he, and I just felt this peace and this comfort come over me. And I was at work, and I was trying not to cry because I'm sitting there at my desk, and I'm trying not to cry. But his kindness and his love appeared unto me. Someone who should know. Someone who should not doubt his value. Someone who should not doubt that God loves me, that my family loves me, that my church loves me. Someone who should not worry about that. But his love showed up towards me. Verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. We do not deserve his love or his kindness. We don't deserve it. You could witness to every single person that you've ever come in contact with, and it will never add up to deserving the love and kindness of Jesus Christ. But that is the most beautiful thing ever. It is. Some of, us, some of you aren't believing me right now. You're not believing me that that's beautiful because you want to hold a value. But let me tell you something. The most beautiful part is no matter what we've ever done, we still hold a value to him. It doesn't matter because if you believed that it was by the works of our righteousness, some of us would work ourselves into the ground and die and never be satisfied by the blood, sweat, and tears, and we would not make it to eternity because we would never be satisfied with the work that we did. But Jesus says, you were a sinner, but I showed up anyway. I showed up to the one who is in the darkest hour, and I showed up for the one who was born in the church. We are all going to make it if we turn to Jesus. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. We cannot continue the curse of Adam and Eve by creating space between us and God. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There are times that you wish the verse would just stop and that the next half would never come. James 4, 8, I, I'm going to say most of James is like that. James, if you don't want conviction, do not read James. James 4, 8 is one of those scriptures where the beginning sounds so great, and it's exactly what we want. And then we find out how to achieve it. The scripture informs me in order to be close to God, there is an expectation placed upon me. There are things that I must release. There are things that I must let go. I must let go of my self-doubt in myself. I must let go of the times that I think that I'm not worthy. I must let go of the thing that is, it was a pain in the past, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get hurt again. We must surrender it to God. 
God wants access to us and the things that we hold dear. Galatians 5.1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Jesus has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. There are things we are afraid or refuse to let go of. Things we have held on to for so long because it just makes sense for me to keep it. And I'm worried this morning that there's stuff in our life that God is trying to deal with. But we are so afraid of what the outcome is going to be. And we are so concerned with the unknown that we have figured out a workaround so that we can keep them. Hurt and pain, God wants to deliver it this morning. Your loneliness, God wants to deliver you this morning. Brother Wyatt, loneliness is not a big thing. Let me tell you something. Loneliness left untouched turns to hurt. Loneliness left unbothered turns to pain. It is not a lesser thing. Marriage and family issues, God wants to restore this morning. Brothers, if you could bring that picture up. This is the thing that I found a year ago scrolling through Facebook. It is, for those of you who don't know, I don't really see much about it, but I really like Jeep Wranglers. One day, I hope God blesses me with one. But I have all these pages and I, that I follow that have Jeep Wrangler stuff on it, and I, I, I know how to remove the doors and the top, and all, I know how to do all kinds of stuff with something that I do not have. And someone posted this in there, and they had these rusty shackles on their Jeep. And they began to spray paint them. And when they removed them, they posted it and said, painting shackles makes smiley faces. And I feel that we find ourselves in this position sometimes. Where we've got a hurt and a pain and a chain and a shackle that we've had for so long. And oh, I know it's dirty and I know I need to let it go. And I know God keeps dealing it with dealing with me for it. But let me just cover it up. And it'll give me a little bit of a smile. Let me just paint it and and I'll get a little bit of a laugh after I've covered up the hurt a little bit. You don't have to paint it. Jesus wants to remove it. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Some of us have had stuff, Sister Johnson, for a long time. Some of us have stuff that, that's not just us. Our, our grandfather had it, and our father had it, and, and our uncle had it, and now I'm going to have it, and I'm, I'm afraid that my kid is going to have it. you got to give that up to Jesus because where the Spirit is, for he is the Spirit. Oh, my goodness. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I'm trying to mess everything up this morning. Just because we have figured out a way to make something beautiful and live with it does not change the fact that it's still a shackle. Just because we have figured out a way to make it work in our life and fit in with our family doesn't mean it shouldn't be delivered this morning. God is trying to close a gap. He wants to fill a space this morning. He wants, he wants to take these things that we have in our life and remove them. But there's so many areas we try to cut out. That we try to say, Jesus, I don't want you to have access to this. I was, we were in church a couple, it was probably a month ago now, and God began to speak to me about Pontius Pilate. And God began to talk about washing and how he has washed us. And he said, but there was another washing that took place. 
that was not of your soul. And I began to listen and began to write as he began to talk to me. And he said that when I stood before Pilate, Pilate wanted to free me because he, Pilate didn't find any wrong in Jesus. There was no reason for him to, to be crucified. There was no reason for him to be punished because he was blameless and Pilate wanted to free him. But Pilate looked at the crowd and the Bible says that he saw that there was a tumult and that they were not going to allow him to do this. And, and, and Pilate then has the bright idea of, you know what, I'm going to wash my hands of this. So Pilate says, I'm not dealing with Jesus in this part of my life. So he began to wash his hands. And as he dried the water off of his hands, he had removed Jesus from his life and created a space between him and the Savior. We cannot do that. Lord, I, I, I want my finances to be blessed. But I, th this tithing is just, I, I need to pay bills. I want to be free, but this addiction, I've had it for so long, I'm going to wash my hands of Jesus in this. I want to be a witness, but man, I, I don't know, I don't want my friends to think this of me. Jesus, you can't have access to this part of my life. And we begin to wash our hands. But Jesus wants to wash you this morning. We have tons of animals at home. We have three dogs and two cats and two goats and two pigs. And I tried really hard to convince my wife to let me get a donkey. And, uh, and we just, it, it wasn't in the books to get that donkey. And, and. With the dogs, we have these really large metal water bowls, um, and I mean, they're, they're huge, and I, I've probably told this story before. Good thing Ryan's not here. Inside joke on that one. Um, but we have these water bowls, and we sit them on the, the sink and to fill them with water, and Emily was filling it one time, and she walked away, and we weren't paying attention, and I, we began to hear water dripping. We ran out into the kitchen. I don't know how long it had been overflowing, but it felt like, by the looks of it, it was a long time. And I shut the water off, and I am, like, just sloshing through water in our kitchen. And, and I'm like, Emily, what's going on? And she's all mad because I was like, what's going on? And I, I raised my voice, and I raised my voice at the situation, not at her, and she was upset, and I was upset, and I'm washing water, I'm cleaning up water and all this mess and everything. And we thought we kept a tidy house, Sister Johnson. But you see, when things begin to be washed, and you come in contact with water, and you come in contact with the blood of Jesus, stuff begins to be exposed. And that water went all down the counter, and it went underneath the stove, and, and we had to pull things out. And I'm telling you, we are dirty. And all this junk, and I was like, where is all this coming from? And this morning, let Jesus wash you. If the musicians would come. He is trying to draw nigh this morning. He wants you to receive of him. He is trying to get you in contact with his blood this morning. If you have been baptized in Jesus' name, you just have to repent right now. You just have to say his name, and the blood of Calvary will come running to you. But this morning, if you have never experienced Acts 2.38, and Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you've never been baptized, if you've never repented, Jesus wants you this morning. If you'll stand as we read the last scripture.
Psalm 73, 28 says, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Why don't we just lift our hands this morning? Jesus, we want to receive from you, Lord. All the hurt and all the pain and all the secret stuff that we've never told anybody, God. Lord, wash me, God, again. Lord, let me be broken in your sight. And we get so caught up on being strong. And, and this morning, why don't you break in the presence of God? Let him build you. This altar is open, and I hope that you'll fill it up. I hope that you will take a step out and put your flesh in subjection to the Holy Ghost. That's what comes. I know you can pray at your seat, but when we come to the altar, we're telling our fresh flesh, you are not in control. This altar's open this morning as they sing.
something interesting about water. The Bible says that Jesus, his first miracle, turning water into wine, that he didn't touch anything. He simply spoke. And unknown, unnamed men went and did what he told them to do. The interesting thing about water is that it takes on the properties of what it touches. Jesus didn't have to touch it because his presence was in the room. His presence is here this morning. Now he wants to touch you, but he will not do so without permission. But his presence is here. You can take on his properties if you so desire. And there's something else about water is that it'll just keep going. Not stagnant, dead water, flowing water will continue to move until it has removed all impurities out of whatever it's flowing over. Is that not clear enough? I think it's pretty clear, right? Pilate washing his hands with water that wasn't going to make a difference. Because the water giver, the wine giver, was beside him. All he had to do was ask. But Pilate wanted to make space between, don't touch me. You can talk. Jesus wasn't interested in talking. But if Pilate had went up to him with honesty, he'd have got something he'd never had in his whole life. If that chief priest hadn't been going through the crowd and telling them, say, crucify him, and had been paying attention to who they were talking about, he would have changed their lives forever. He had spoke plenty to them that would have offered them the opportunity. One of them did. Nicodemus, he came to him by night, but he came. What did he tell Nicodemus? You must be born again of the water and of the Spirit. He was telling him something. He's telling us something this morning. If we would just listen, remove the space between you and him, and you will find out who he really is. You will find out that all that stuff that you've been wanting and even the things that you created the space for in the first place will be answered by removing it and letting yourself, I said letting yourself be close to him. Another interesting thing about water is what it does to things that are harder than it is. If given enough time, water changes rock. Do not rush his presence. Do not think about your fried chicken. You're getting ready to go. It's early even. He's not known for preaching long messages. But his presence is still here. I'm telling you, he's still here. He has an answer for you. And if you'll just take the blocks off, if you'll just get that, whatever that is that you're putting up right now, keeping Jesus, your Savior, at arm's length, you're going to find out how wonderful he really is and the answer that you've been looking for everywhere else but him. Here's what I'm going to ask for you to do right now. I'm going to ask if it's appropriate for you to take the hand of the person that's beside you. One of those things that, oh, no, we don't like the preacher say to do that. Well, this morning I want you to do it. We believe in this house. There's a whole bunch of saints that not perfect, but desire to serve God. So it's good to have contact with them, isn't it? You get some of their properties, you understand, on you. I believe that this is what happens when the, the Scripture talks of the laying on of hands. The reason that we do it is because the Word says to do it, but the real reason that it's the Word says to do it is because it's a transference of the Spirit of God. So right now, be cognizant of that. Let's pray. Pray for that person whose hand you are holding and not yourself. Lord Jesus, I pray right now that you will touch my brother, touch my sister, this person. 
who I'm touching right now, I pray you touch them. I pray you reveal yourself to them. Open their eyes to see the reality of you. Not a far off history name, not a distant thing, not a religious thing, but you, who you really are. That you are real, that you really love them, and that you really want to move in their life. Let them know it right now. Let everything that would be shaken be shaken until all that remains is yours. Remove the space from my brother and my sister and you. Right now, by the authority of the word of God and the power that is precious name of Jesus, the name above all other names, your way this morning, that's it, flow freely over them right now, I am praying for them the way that I hope somebody is praying for me, I am praying for them in the way that I hope someone else prays for me right now. fervent prayer of a righteous person does a lot of good. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Call out his name over him. In the name of Jesus. Bless him, Jesus. Touch him, Jesus. this morning, Jesus. Let the seed be planted in the heart and mind. Let it not be easily shaken out. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. I said in Jesus' name. Would you bow your head with me this morning? If you are still praying, please continue. If you feel to continue to pray, nobody's going to stop you. Nobody's going to interfere. Lord Jesus, I'm grateful for your message this morning, and I'm grateful for your people. I pray, Almighty God, that you will make us what you desire for us to be. Today you will bless us as we go from this place that your hand will rest mightily upon us, I pray. We will understand that our freedom and liberty do not come the whim of men comes from you. You give it. I pray, oh Lord, that you will keep us. Walk with us and talk with us. Touch us. We remove the space between. Deal with us as you wish. For we are yours. And you are ours. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Let's lift him up one more time.